This is Mindset for Success with your host, Dr. Leslie Knudsen. Each week, she will interview women entrepreneurs to explore the unconscious psychological struggles they faced as they build their businesses and how they overcame them. Here's your host, Leslie Knudsen. Hi, Britt. I'm so excited to have you today on my podcast. I'm going to introduce you um, to our listeners. Britt is a Harvard Business School graduate, expert investor, money mindset coach, and founder of of a business on um, money management. She is on a mission to serve those who have traditionally been left out of the financial world. Britt heals her clients' stories around money and simplifies finance with her signature step-by-step process. She makes saving fun and getting out of debt possible for women from all backgrounds. So welcome, Britt, to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Britt, as you know, it takes a lot to be a successful female entrepreneur. And business acumen is key, but we rarely talk about the psychological challenges that women often face to achieve that success. I refer to these as those negative and sometimes persistent thoughts that create doubt, undermine success, and can destroy self-confidence, risk-taking, and decision-making, and overall happiness and satisfaction in life. To, to begin, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your journey to become an in- entrepreneur. Why, why did you want to study international health as an undergraduate, and what did you do afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why did I study international health? That's a great question. Uh, I would say, you know, given that I didn't go into international health, I really chose it because I've always cared about health and just being... Um, I believe that when people feel good in their bodies that anything is possible. And so it's really this driven by this core belief of wanting endless possibilities for people. And we'll get into that later with Dow James and the reason for starting that as well. But with international health, it was this idea of, you know, health is one of those the cornerstones, cornerstones or foundations of people living the lives that they want to live. So that was the intention behind studying it mm-hmm. in undergrad. Um, but I ended up not going into that at all. I um, right. went to college, had a job, uh, had a job opportunity working in management consulting out in San Francisco. And mm-hmm. before I accepted that job offer, I decided to spend a few months biking across New Zealand, working on organic farms. And I would say mm-hmm. this example of you know having this job offer lined up, but choosing to go this alternative path is a good way of encapsulating what I'm all about, which is this, you know, this drive to improve people's lives and, you know, be a professional, but also this sense of adventure and wildness. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did the same thing when I graduated from Harvard Business School, actually spent my first summer working for Backroads, an outdoor travel company, Mm -hmm. leading families on vacations in the Yellowstone Mm -hmm. and Tetons before, before really jumpstarting my life in the business world. Mm Mm-hmm. And what's important to you about doing that? What, what, what is it? What's the benefit? Where does it get you sort of in terms of thinking about work and who you are and what you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that balance feels really important to me of both working hard and then infusing fun and play into our lives. I guess I have this mentality of life is short. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up with parents who um, had a similar attitude of, of work hard, play hard. They would take us out of school and take us on vacation or um, mm-hmm. they both worked for themselves. And so there was a lot of time to just play <laughs> at, together mm-hmm. as a family. Mm-hmm. And so that's been a really important value of mine throughout my life. You, you talk about working in a management consulting firm. Um, and of course, you could have gone back to corporate after Harvard Business School, but you didn't. So I can imagine that not having a clear path, maybe, maybe not, uh, may have had some risk for you. Yeah, you know, this I did want to acknowledge this, um, and this is probably a great place to do it, is that 
I have uh, lived a really privileged life. Um, of course, I've faced hard times, but as a cisgender white woman with access to resources, my life has been quite privileged. And so mm -hmm. that moment of, you know, is this risky to not have a job lined up? I just believed that I would find something and it would be mm -hmm. okay. And I had savings to fall back on in the meantime. And so that I just want to acknowledge is, mm -hmm. um, you know, not what everyone is coming from. And I try to use that platform to increase the education and access to possibilities for other people who might not have had the same privilege growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're saying is too, is that risk for you felt manageable because you knew that you had uh, support? Yeah, I believed in my ability to to network and find a job. So I, mm -hmm. yeah, I technically <laughs> left Harvard Business School with a, you know, a job that was paying me five dollars mm -hmm. an hour, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but believed that I would, you know, meet people as soon as I moved out to the Bay Area and find a job, and that's exactly what I did within a month of moving out there. So I can imagine some of the reason in terms of feeling like recognizing, acknowledging that you come from a privileged background is also part of why helping women is important to you. Exactly. Yeah, there's, um, it's especially important for, yeah, helping women who aren't just like me. Um, women have been disadvantaged in the financial industry for entirety. I mean, we didn't have access to credit on our own or um, bank accounts on our own until the 70s. And so we're catching up and there's a lot, you know, women are just left out of financial conversations these days. Mm -hmm. it's a space where women can talk about money freely and without shame and with support felt mm -hmm. uh, just like what we, what we needed to actually get on equal ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How was it to work in corporate for you in terms of that sensitivity towards women and women's opportunities or the opaqueness of the, of the, of the banking system? Yeah. Uh, when I worked in consulting, I was, felt really lucky in that I had incredible women managers who were in mm -hmm. leadership. So they were partners at the consulting firm. They were managers on their way to becoming partners. And that felt critical for me to see, to see examples of people in my shoes, um, you know, ahead of me, <laughs> for example. Yeah, yeah. And I'll acknowledge that they were also cisgender white women. So there mm -hmm. is, you know, there was not a lot of diversity in management consulting, especially at our small boutique firm. So um, it helps, it helps to have role models and mentors who look like you ahead of you. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Um, tell me about having um, the imposter syndrome. I think we talked a little bit about that before that Sometimes that's something that kind of hangs over you. Yeah, yeah. Way. And it's and I I will say that it it hangs over me in different phases of my cycle. I don't know how much you're getting into this in these conversations with women, right. but um, I I track my cycle quite closely. And during my luteal phase is where I really suffer from the imposter syndrome. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm not good enough to be doing this, or I don't have enough structure in my life, or I should be more organized, or um, you know, why would anyone want to promote us? Like, should I, who should I be reaching out to? Who do I deserve to reach out to? Um, mm -hmm. And what helps is having a business partner actually, so that, you know, we can balance each other out and mm -hmm. shoot big, even if we, you know, don't believe in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's something that, yeah, I try to keep at bay by, um, but also this is something I've practice is is doing the things that I am good at so mm -hmm. you know one of my skills is just is getting things done and getting things across the finish line mm -hmm. whereas my business partner brings a lot of the structure and so mm -hmm. just you know mm -hmm. letting her own the structure piece of it and then I'll finish the execution piece has worked well so it sounds also like getting stuff over the finish line is something you're good at and also kind of drives you absolutely and where does that come from how, how did you figure out how to do that? I mean, it was probably natural, but tell me yeah. a little bit about where that came from. Uh, it's probably a mix of um, the work ethic that I saw in my mom. Um, there's mm -hmm. never a moment where she is not working. <laughs> she mm -hmm. mm -hmm. works all the time. And when she's not working, she is shoveling snow off of our back deck. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, there you go. <laughs> it's there you nonstop. Go. 
And so that was emulated to me, just like the value of hard work. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was also rewarded in me. I you know, grew up in a family where academic success was, you know, you, you were um, mm -hmm. congratulated for your A in school. And so I learned mm -hmm. um, just the, how good it felt to be, you know, acknowledged and mm -hmm. uh, rewarded for mm -hmm. achievement. And so it was um, yeah, probably a mix of nature and nurture. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Do you ever find yourself concerned about making decisions or taking risks? Is it ever hard for you to kind of get to a place to decide to do something kind of maybe a little bit difficult or beyond your comfort zone? Yeah, and I would say this comes, you know, speaking of financials, the the hardest, especially in starting the business, we bootstrapped this business. Um, you know, we're we only invested money that we made in the business in the business, and so mm -hmm. we're working with a limited amount of cash, and mm -hmm. those risks that would use a bunch of cash without a guarantee of return, for example, spending money on Facebook ads, mm -hmm. was, is, still is a challenge for me to believe mm -hmm. that we are going to get a return from this. This is going to be a good investment. That is something that I have had to get a lot of coaching on um, mm -hmm. because I, you know, grew up with this mentality of, um, you know, there's, it's, funny given my privilege that I still grew up with the like there's not enough mindset um mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. really common we see this in women all the time this scarcity mindset of even when you mm -hmm. have enough money this fear that you're it's gonna run out and I have mm -hmm. that fear in the business and I've really had to overcome that uh because investing in the business is so important especially at this time when we're um growing as quickly as we are, you know, every money we spend in ads is, you know, returns to us six times. And so it's like, so how have you been able to, to overcome that? I mean, what have you done? You talked about your partner as being a really, um, in the business as being really helpful. Mom, what other things like have you done? I know coaching too, to, to be able to kind of not let the scarcity paralyze you. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I would say having a team of people to support me in different ways. So various coaches, mm -hmm. uh, different um, mindset practices of, you know, meditation and mm -hmm. uh, mantras that I can repeat of like, there is enough, there is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and then coaches who can just walk me through the logic of it too, of like, mm -hmm. here's your return on ad spend, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Lorianne put it in investment perspective. She was like, where else can you get a 60% return on your money? You're not getting that in the mm -hmm. stock market. Like you might mm -hmm. as well put this in. Right, yeah. right. So, so kind of de-escalating the panic. Yes, absolutely. And teaching, just learning the concept behind it um, helped for me in the way I think as well. For some women, it can be difficult, as you can imagine, to ask for what they believe. I'm sorry, but ask what they uh, what they believe they deserve. Have you ever found your soft, sensitive side getting in the way of your ability of asking for what you think you deserve? And what advice would you give to women on how to negotiate this? Mm. Yeah, so such a good question. I think what keeps me back from from asking for what I deserve. And I think this is what keeps a lot of women back is not actually having a firm sense of what I do deserve. Um, and that's my own self work to sit and to make those, to set it out clearly of like, mm -hmm. here's what I deserve and why. Um, mm -hmm. But not getting clear on that is the first barrier to asking for it. And why do you think you're not clear on it? Ah. <sighs> I think because um, uh, oh, that's such a good question. I think probably has to do this is a much bigger uh, answer, but like probably has to do with self worth and just mm -hmm. believing mm -hmm. in my own um, yeah worthiness. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Capabilities. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered yourself someone who hasn't always fit in? And if oh so, did it ever lead, oh my gosh, or did it ever lead to self doubt? <laughs> and what did you do to kind of get over this? Did it ever lead to what was that? Um, self doubt, 
Mm, Any yes. difficulties for you? And if so, how did you get over it? Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know. I just thought it just happened to everyone in middle school and high school, but I definitely went through a period of being, um, you know, I grew up in Idaho. 